that's pretty useful. Um, uh, so for example, you can use this sort of thing to say that there must be infinitely many elements of S in that interval. Right? If, if we have the same, suppose we're in the same situation, right? then actually there have to be, um, if I take any epsilon here, there actually must be infinitely many elements of S in here. Right? Can somebody tell me why? Can somebody explain why? Just now we said there must be one element of S in there. Right? If this guy is not in S, there must, for any epsilon, there must be one guy in there. Well, in fact, that implies there must be infinitely many. Um, me and <coughs> Okay, uh, I'll give you one minute to think, uh, to let everybody think. Talk to somebody next to you and say, say, I think it'll better have small to make the other possible. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, seems like a lot of people are smiling and nodding. So, um, uh, who would like to? <laughs> um, who would like to explain? Who would like to? Who, who who thinks they understand? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, Katie, you go first. I was thinking if you're subtracting an epsilon, if mm -hmm. you can, if you take an even smaller value of that epsilon. Like an infinitely smaller value, then there's going to be something contained within the supreme and the epsilon value. So you just find like infinitely many epsilon values, and there's always going to be something in between. Okay, great. So you're thinking like a sort of constructive, constructive approach. You say, well, look, let's start off with one epsilon. Somebody gives you an epsilon, you say, well, we already showed there's got to be somebody in there, right? So let's call it uh, S uh, S1, right? Well then, uh, now let's take that distance as our second epsilon, right? Let's call this thing, um, let's call this distance epsilon, epsilon prime, right? Well, by, by the statement we proved earlier, there must be somebody between here and here, right? And so on and so forth, right? And so you, no, you know, no matter how many you have, there's always, you can always add one more, right? Okay. So yeah, that will, that will, that will show it. Um, another way would be to do by contradiction. You would say, well, suppose that there are only finitely many guys, right? Then what? Suppose there are only finitely many guys in there. Then? What, then? Uh, there, well, there is an interval that still doesn't happen, so you choose an epsilon such that this would be. Right, right. So you basically do the same thing as what we did here, mm -hmm. right? If there's only finally many guys there, you know that one of them is the closest, right? You know, there's a you take you look at all the distances and you say, well, which is this? We can we can you know by one argument or another choose the smallest distance, and then you'd say for that smallest distance there's nobody in there, and so that's so this is not the supremum anymore, right? So you could do it that way as well. Okay. So there must be infinitely many guys. Um, what this shows is that in fact. If the supremum is not in there, then in fact there must be a sequence, right? S1, S2, S3, S4, blah, blah, blah. There must be a sequence that approaches the supremum from the bottom, right? And gets arbitrarily close to it. In other words, it's sort of a sequence whose limit is the supremum. Now we haven't talked about what a limit is, but, but we'll talk about it in the next class. Okay, but that's what it shows me. Okay, 
So, um, right, getting back to uh, the real numbers, we're talking about the, the least upper bound property. Um, somebody just tell me what the least upper bound property says. What does the least upper bound property say? Should I bring up? I finally have my 20 sided dime. Number 18. Six, <laughs> six, we are at zero. <laughs> Tell me what the least upper bound property is. Um, ah, you should not look at it. Oh, I don't know that. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you should know. You better know. Uh, so, least upper bound, actually. Okay, go ahead. Uh, go ahead and read it. If you don't okay. Know. If S has an upper bound and S has a least upper bound or not? Right. So, um, in R, so in the field R, right, if, if, if uh, S on empty has an upper bound, so S is a subset of R and S is not empty. If S has an upper bound, then it has a least upper bound. Peculiar looking property is is actually the thing that makes R special. Okay. And so um, right, we finished up last time with sort of a sketch of the fact that the least upper bound axiom implies some sort of greatest lower bound axiom. Right, that if you have a set that has a lower bound, then it's guaranteed to have a greatest lower bound. Um, it's guaranteed to have a greatest lower bound, and you just flip it over and do the argument from there. And that was part of your homework. Okay. So, um, okay. So, um, other consequences. Other consequences. Of the least of the bound. Um, the first is called the Archimedean property. Archimedean. Property of R. It says, well, um, given any x, y, and R, um, uh, if x is positive, then, then, the existent n in the natural numbers such that nx exceeds 1. Given any pairs, given any pair of numbers, if one of them is positive, then there's got to be a multiple of it that exceeds the other guy. And um, the proof is by, by contradiction. Proof is by contradiction and using, of course, the least upper bound axiom. You know it's going to be the least upper bound axiom. Okay. Did, did, anyone, did anyone get this proof? Did anyone understand it well enough that they feel, feel like they wouldn't mind talking about it. Like, what's the idea? John, you look like you're itching. You, you look like you'd like to. You flip it, uh, in inequality. Start with that. And, uh, I guess I go from there. But yeah, yeah. Know. So you say, well, look, um, right. Uh, this is saying that there's got to be some n where nx exceeds this, mm -hmm. right? There's got to be some n where nx exceeds this. So what's the opposite of that? nx is less than or equal to y. Right, nx is less than or equal to y for all, for all n. Okay, so let's suppose nx is less than or equal to y for all n. <coughs>
Okay. What's the next move? Can anybody tell me what sort of the obvious next move is? Supremum. Oh, sorry. It's okay. So, so yeah, Supremum. Uh, who, who can complete the rest of John's sentence? The Supremum. What's the next move, right? You know that nx is less than y for all for all n, right? nx is less than y for all n. Actually, I'll let you talk to each other for one for just one minute and say, of course, the next move we're going to make is blah. <laughs> okay, good because it, it, it there's there's actually a few clues on the board that should should hint to you what the next move is. Actually, there's one big clue on the board that should hint to you. You try to capture a flag on the other side. All the pieces, you don't know where any of, you, all the pieces are turned so you don't see his pieces, right? And the, the game is to capture the other guy's flag. And like, I'm standing right next to his flag, and I'm like, like this. He's like, no, 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 no. He's like, don't call on me. <laughs> um, anyway, um, uh, so um, who, who would like to say? Mia, you look like you have something to say. No? Um, if you don't, that's okay. Would you say that y is the least upper bound? You, why would it be the least upper bound? Because it might be equal to it. If it were equal to one of these guys, if it were equal to one of these guys, yeah, it would be the least upper bound. It would be the least upper bound. But at this point, you don't know that it is, right? So what, but, but although you don't know it's the least upper bound, you know it is an upper bound, right? right? In that case, in that case, right, the set, the set, um, uh, y is an upper bound for the set nx where n is zero. Right. And so, John, go ahead. Well, I would say like, let, let S not be the supremum. Right, right. So by the least of rebound axiom, you know that there is a supremum, right? So now we, we, we use the least of rebound. Least of rebound axiom implies there exists some supremum of the set okay. uh, they, they call it alpha in the book. Let's call it, let's call it alpha. Okay. Okay. So here's the picture, right? Here is alpha. And you know that um, there's a bunch of nx's, right? N1x, N2x, right? All the all the nx's lie beneath alpha. Okay. 
All the NXs lie beneath alpha. This guy is the supremum. So, um, so, so what? What can you say? That those upper bounds are less than alpha. All these guys are less than alpha. That's true. All these guys are less than alpha. Um, but we have something and better. Then, Remember, then we can that. express those upper bounds in terms of alpha. We can express. The upper bound. What upper bounds? Oh, uh, like the the ones in the, the ones below the upper bounds. These guys are. I'm 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 using these guys to be oh. elements of the set. These are, oh, these okay. aren't upper bounds. These are elements okay. of the set. Sure, that was okay. So yeah, these are all elements of the set. Like there's you know there's x, there's x, there's two x, there's three x, there's four x, right? There's and five x, blah, blah, blah. All those guys are inside, are beneath, for some reason, all those guys are beneath alpha. Right? Okay. So, um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, look at alpha, alpha minus one. Okay. Look at the interval of alpha, alpha minus one, comma, comma alpha. Consider alpha minus one, comma alpha. What can we say? Can we say anything? We must contain n. OK. Right. Um, if, what value? Yeah, it yeah, yeah, must contain no matter what the OK, OK. So um, I guess we have to, to so uh, as long as alpha is not in this set, As long as alpha is not in this set, we know that um, uh, it contains, uh, there exists some uh, n, nx in alpha minus one. That's a contradiction because you know supposedly alpha was the supremum of, of all multiples of x, but here we found a multiple of x that's bigger than alpha. Yeah. 
Yeah, you too. Because alpha minus x, um, well, x is bigger than 0, so alpha minus x is less than alpha, <coughs> right? And alpha was the least upper bound, so anything smaller than it is not an upper bound, right? So the picture, right, is the least upper bound. <coughs> you say, well, let's look at alpha minus x. That's not an upper bound. So there must be somebody in here, and not. If that guy's not an upper bound, there must be some guy in there. Add one to it, right? Add one to it. Um, I'm sorry. Add one to the, mul to the multiple of it, right? And you get, you get something bigger than alpha. Right? And so there's a contradiction. Okay. Any, any questions? Your, your eyebrows twitched for one second. No, I think. Um, you good? Anybody? Ria, you look nervous to me. Are you nervous? I'm just processing. You're processing, okay. okay. So the calculation says alpha is not an upper bound. Yeah, yeah, right. Because um, right, alpha is supposed to be an upper bound for this set, all, all multiples of x are supposed to be less than or equal to alpha, right? But here we've created somebody, um, we've created a multiple of x who is bigger than alpha, contradiction, right? Alpha was um, uh, an upper bound of n, right? So it should be bigger than or equal to everybody in it. But here we found somebody who's strictly bigger than it. Okay. Okay. The next one is a little bit is um, I think if if you found that indigestible indigestible, then uh, the next one will be even more indigestible. <coughs> but uh, let's let's try it. So the last the last part of this section was the, the density property. Um, uh, is dense in R. So, um, okay. so let A and B be real numbers, and A less than B. Um, then, there exists an R in Q such that R is between A and B. So between any real numbers, you can find a rational number. Okay. The proof of this is a little bit, a little bit tricky. Um, but here we go. <coughs> so it's the proof. We want to show that we can find a rational number <coughs> Q. Let's say R is m over n, where um, n is bigger than zero. So without loss of generality. <coughs> We can assume n is bigger than zero. Right? If it's a negative, if it's a negative number, we'll just put the negative on the m rather than on the n. Make negative. Make m negative. Okay. Um, where m and n are, are integers. So we want to show that um, uh, 
such that A is less than R is less than B. Oops. Number of N is less than B. I.e. such that um, A N is less than M is less than B. Okay. So that's our goal. Right? We're looking for integers M and N such that this happens. And N is, N is going to be positive. So somebody has given us um, A and B, and we're trying to we're trying to find M and N that, that work that make this work. Okay. <coughs> okay. So uh, say well by the Archimedean property. So we use the previous result to get this. By the Archimedean property, um, <coughs> we know that there exists an N such that um, if we look at b minus a, right, um, b minus a is positive. We find something that's bigger than one. Right. Our comedian property said that you know if we have two numbers, we can. You know, some multiple of, of the positive guy will be bigger than the other guy, right? So our two numbers, our two numbers are going to be b minus a and one, right? B minus a is positive. We can find some multiple of it that exceeds one. Okay, okay. that's good, right? Because um, uh, that that tells us that n b <coughs> a is bigger than one. Pretty good, right? Why? Why is that good? Well, because you know there is an interaction between Right, right. Because since the distance between here is bigger than one, you know, remember what our goal is. We're trying to find um, m and n such that you know m lies between a n and b n, right? Well, here's here here are a n. Using this n, using this n, we found you know. An, we found, we found an n so that the distance between a n and b n is bigger than 1. There ought to be an integer inside there, and then that's the end. Okay. But we actually have to prove that there's an integer inside there. <laughs> okay, so that, you know, um, and that actually turns out to be the tricky part. Okay, so, we're, but we're halfway there, right? Well, we're actually maybe a tenth of the way there. <laughs> okay, so, um, so if we can find if we can show, so take that, take that n as you know the one we're looking for. Take that. We'll use that. We'll use that. <coughs> um, it now suffices to show. Show it suffices to show that there exists an M and Z between A N and B. Right? Once we find that M, then we're done. Does M have to be an integer or just a It has to be an integer. integer. Right. It has to be an integer because we're looking for a rational number. We're looking for a rational number. Right? Yeah, we want a rational number, so it has to be an integer or oh, an integer. Okay. Yeah, it has to be an integer. Okay, so um, uh, so um, well, we're going to use Archimedean property again. So find the Archimedean property again. Um, 
we know that there exists a k that is bigger than um, the maximum of the absolute value of a n and b n. So k, where k is some, is some integer. Uh, k is some natural number. Okay, so right, we're using the Archimedean property twice. Um, right, you look at you look at one comma absolute value a n, and you also look at one comma absolute value b n. Right. Use the Archimedean property on each of these guys. You know that there's some multiple of one that's bigger than that. You know that there's some multiple of one that's bigger than that. Take the larger. There's, there's going to be some k1, so that k1 times 1 is bigger than that. There's going to be some k2, such that k2 is times that is bigger than that. So let k1 be the larger of those guys. Does that, does that make sense? Right, so um, right. Uh, we know there exists a k1 such that k1 times 1 is bigger than a, a n. There exists, there exists a k2 also such that k2 times 1 is bigger than b n. Right, um, uh, let k be the larger of k1 and k2. Let, let k be the larger of those twos, of those two, then k is bigger than, you know, either um, it's going to be bigger than an and bigger than, um, it's going to be bigger than both of those guys. So just to expand this one, this one, this one inequality. Why? Okay. Any any questions? Of those, of those things. So what does that tell us? That tells us that, um, remember, a, a n is less than b n, right? A n is less than b n, right? Um, because, of, because of this, we know that k is bigger than b n, right? Because k is bigger than the max, bigger than the absolute value of b n, it's certainly bigger than b n. Right. Since k is, is bigger than the max of a n, it's certainly true that negative k is smaller than a n. So, so this is true. Okay. Okay. Now comes the little bit tricky part. Um, Consider these two sets. Uh, capital K is going to be um, the set of all integers where between negative K and K. Okay, so that's an easy one. Just the, just the integers between negative K and K. Negative K, negative K plus one, blah blah blah, blah all the way up to K. Okay, so it's just just a bunch of integers. J B the J who are in K, right, who are in the previous range, the guys who are in the previous range, where J is bigger than A A M.
k. So k is just right, k is just integers integers right from negative k up to positive k. And j is anybody, any one of those integers uh, who is bigger than a sub n, a, a times n. Okay? Just look at all the guys in here, all these guys who are bigger than j, j n, uh, a n. Okay. Um, notice that, that uh, k is finite. Right? k is a finite set, so j is also a finite set. Both of these guys are finite sets. Right? Because there's only finitely many guys here, right? So they're both finite. Um, and notice that uh, that uh, k is in j. K is in k, and k is in j. Um, no, j is j is an arbitrary thing. So k, remember what k was. This k. This k. Yeah, this k. So we took that k, and we said, look at everything between here and here. Um, remember, that k satisfied this thing, right? So certainly, that k works here, right? That k is in here, and it satisfies this thing. So that, that in fact, I don't use The main thing is that k works for the second set. So anyway, these sets are not empty. So um, since they're finite and not empty, uh, we can take a minimum. Let n be the minimum of j. Okay. So take the set and take the smallest guy in there. Right? There's somebody in there who is the smallest bound. Take that. Um, then we notice that one m of course is bigger than a n, right? Because it's in j, it's in j. and um, we remember that a n is less than a n is bigger than negative k, right? So together, k, negative k is less than a a n. About a minute, I think. <coughs> um, uh, further, since further, since n is in k, right? N is in k, and m is bigger than negative k. Uh, right. Right. M is strictly bigger than negative k. So n minus 1 is also in k. Okay. Because m is in this range, and it's not the bottom term. Right. M, is in, m is somewhere in here. It's not the bottom term. So m minus 1 must be in there also. Right. M is not the bottom. So n minus 1 must also be in there. Now, um, n minus 1 is bigger than a times n because m was the minimal guy. Right? m was minimal. So n minus 1 uh, is going to be so we have n minus 1 is less than or equal to a sub n, a, a times n. And so um, n is less than a n plus 1. Um, uh, okay, so 
now recall that bn minus an is bigger than 1, so bn is bigger than an plus 1. And so we have, um, what we have is that m is less than or equal to an plus 1, is less than bn. Right? But m was greater than a, a n, right? Right? And so that's it. M is it. We found the m. We found the m that lies between a n and b and b n. Okay. So that's how you do it. Sorry to keep you over.